questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning. Uh, Speaker, this Conservative government failed to notice $10.8 million being siphoned off by a senior bureaucrat, money that was intended to support families during the worst of the pandemic. And the Liberal government before that failed to notice $36.6 million stolen through a computer consultant scam by the same thief. He could do this in large part due to the fact that this government and others are over-relying on expensive private consulting firms. Speaker, to the Premier, will he cut down on his government's use of overpriced consultants to protect public money? To respond, the government house leader. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Of course, uh, uh, we have been fighting right since the beginning, since 2018, to restore the, uh, uh, Ontario's uh, fiscal situation, and we've been doing an extraordinary job at that. In fact, exactly. not only have we restored the fiscal sanity in the province of Ontario, yep. we've done it while at the same time cutting taxes for the people of the province of Ontario, reducing costs to our small, medium, and large job creators to the tune of over $8 billion, which has seen, which has seen our income rise by over 50 billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. Fifty billion dollars. We've done it while stabilizing electricity rates. We've done it while investing a record amount in infrastructure, a nationwide leading amount in infrastructure, while building 58,000 new and upgraded long-term care beds, while building new schools, uh, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing thousands of jobs come back to the province, billions of dollars in economic activity, Mr. Speaker, and we're doing it because we have had a plan since 2018. That plan is working, and today, Ontario again led the nation in job creation. Yeah. Something. The supplementary question. Merci, uh, Monsieur le Président. Uh, Yes, you see, Mr. Speaker, on our side of the House, we know very well that our, this government is actually saying that uh, they actually like consultants. They do admire very much consulting companies. So uh, we know that we need more transparency and more accountability concerning the contracts, Co in particular because this government uh, is considering to private privatize more public services like healthcare, for example. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, uh, does his government want to create a sunshine list for uh, these uh, consulting people? Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the uh, member opposite. Merci beaucoup pour uh, cette question. Thank you for your question, which is a very important question in this uh, assembly. As uh, the leader of the opposition said, we do have a plan for Ontario. This is a plan to build Ontario. And concerning the Sunshine List and everything that is related to the Sunshine List, it is very important that we work together in order to build Ontario, in order to build an Ontario that is strong. And as the leader said, we three years earlier, not just for some Ontarians, but for all Ontarians, so that we can build Ontario Response. today and deliver a better Ontario to future generations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The final supplementary. I find that rather astonishing, Speaker, because the Conservatives' federal leader is calling for more transparency and accountability into consultant contracts at that level of government. Yeah. Speaker, back to the Premier. Does the Premier think that there should be a lesser standard for his own government? Government House Leader. Le leader parlementaire du gouvernement. In office back in 2018, we've done an extraordinary job of ensuring that uh, uh, the people of the province of Ontario are well served by their government. That has included, of course, uh, a reduction in the use of, uh, of outside consultants. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, it is clear that we had two years worth of a, of a pandemic, and on occasion we did need to have some outside assistance. Now, Speaker, what has that been, meant for the people of the province of Ontario? It has meant uh, a province that led not only North America, but one of the leaders in terms of the entire planet in getting us beyond COVID. And now what does that mean? That means that Ontario, again, is leading the nation in job creation. So I understand I understand why the leader of the, op of the opposition is talking about anything other than creating jobs, because we're leading the nation in terms of job creation. I know why she doesn't want to talk 
why she doesn't want to talk about infrastructure Response. because we are leading the nation in terms of building infrastructure. I know why they don't want to talk about energy because we've stabilized it when they tried to destroy it. On every single measure, Ontario is leading North America, Mr. Speaker. I think it's something to be proud of. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. This government has nothing to be proud of, Speaker. One in four kids are using a food bank right now. Speaker, I'm here for answers for the people of Ontario, and we're not getting any to that question, so let's just try something else here. The government is bulldozing 7,400 acres of protected land in the Greenbelt, Speaker, handing it over to developers who just so happen to be big conservative donors and insiders. But time and time again, this government refuses to tell Ontarians exactly how they picked this land. Through freedom of information requests, the NDP and now investigative journalists, too, have uncovered the existence of a key document that would provide answers, but this government has blocked its release. Speaker, to the Premier, will the government stop stonewalling the release of this document so Ontarians can finally get some answers? Government House Leader. Speaker, as I've said uh, uh, right from the beginning, of course, we will continue to work with, uh, uh, with the, the Integrity Commissioner. Uh, but at the same time, Mr. Speaker, I know why they don't want to talk specifically about building homes for the people of the province of Ontario. Because when they had the balance of power along with the Liberals, Mr. Speaker, what did they do? They put obstacles in the way, which has led us to a crisis of housing in, a, in Ontario. Imagine. Ontario, somewhere that I think Italy fits into Ontario 34 times. And we have a housing crisis here in the province of Ontario. You know why that is? Because the policies that you support day in and day out stop people from being able to, de to develop. In Stouffville, I have a developer who wants to build and 12 years later only now was able to get a shovel in the ground because of those policies. Thanks to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, we're taking away those, uh, those obstacles. We're building homes for the people of the province of Ontario. We're leading the nation in job creation yet again, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is on the move. We're on the right track, and I hope you'll support us on that. A supplementary question. Speaker, we know this isn't about housing. This isn't about housing. If you cared about people and you cared about affordability of housing, you'd bring back rent control. You'd start with that. Jeez. Here's, a, here's another fact Order. for you. Here's another Order. fact for you, Speaker. Order. Government side will come to order so that I can hear the Leader of the Opposition. And restart the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Nerve there, I guess. Uh, Speaker, before last year's election, the Premier promised up and down that he would not touch the Green Belt. But on November 4th, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing broke the Premier's promise. It's hard to believe that the Minister would betray such a big promise without the Premier's permission. So back to the Premier, did the Premier or anyone acting on his behalf direct or authorize any ministry officials to remove lands from the Green Belt prior to last November 4th? House the Minister of Municipal Affairs has been very clear on that, uh, Mr. Speaker, but what we've said right from the beginning, right from 2018, we said that we had to build more homes in the province of Ontario because uh, that was virtually stopped under the Liberals and NDP coalition in this province, Mr. Speaker. People could not build homes. People could not find new homes. And we knew that a Conservative government would restore the economy of this province, that millions of people would want to flood back into Ontario, that billions of dollars of investments would want to come back to the province of Ontario. And what are we seeing, Mr. Speaker? Month after month after month after month, Ontario is leading the nation in terms of job creation. Yet again today, we're doing it, Mr. Speaker. It's built Built on the back of the investments that we're making through the Minister of Economic Job Creation and Trade. We have a bill in front of this House today by the Minister of Red Tape Reduction, which will continue to take away obstacles to job creation Response. and growth. I hope the NDP will do the right thing, support that, and support the thousands of people who finally have the dignity of a job because of the policies of this government. That and the final supplementary. Speaker, the House leader is spinning so fast he's going to take off. <laughs> this government is having a lot of trouble following along, so I'm going to make it very, very simple for them. Speaker, will the Premier rule out any further removals of land from the Greenbelt, yes or no? Government House Leader. Speaker, it's not the government House Leader that's taken off, it's the economy of the province. Yeah. Crazy, 
City Open. Start the clock. Minister, has some time. I'm excited. I'm excited, Mr. Speaker. Why would I not be excited on yet another month where Ontario is leading the nation in job creation? I'm excited. I guess it is a tough time to be the leader of Her Majesty of His Majesty's opposition, right? It's a tough time when you're leading in terms of job creation. It's a tough time when you're leading in terms of building infrastructure. It's a tough time when you're leading in terms of building new schools. It's a tough time when the Minister of Labour has reopened the economy to allow people to get jobs right here. Here, so I understand. I understand why they're so upset. Response. But this is also a good time. It's a good weekend. We're having Passover. Uh, it's uh, it's Easter, Mr. Spirit. The Ontario economy has risen from the dead, which was what the Liberals and NDP brought to this province, and we're on the right track. The next House will come to order. Government side will come to order. Okay, start the clock. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Uh, the House leader was asked a very simple question there, and they failed to provide an answer. My question is to the Premier. Last weekend, I joined hundreds of people from 25 St Mary's and 145 St George who were rallying to save their homes and their buildings from being demolished and turned into condos. These people are stressed and worried because they fear this government is going to gut Toronto's rental protection laws and make it practically impossible for them to return to their home once the construction of the new building is complete. Over 3,441 affordable purpose-built rental homes are at risk of being demolished and turned into condos. We cannot afford to lose these homes, Premier. Will this government commit to preserving Toronto's rental protection laws so these people can keep their homes? To reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. You know, this, this member has a, a, you know, a habit uh, near our uh, housing supply bills to make statements uh, that simply aren't true, and this is one of them. We have not made any changes. I'm going to caution the minister on his use of language and ask him to withdraw. We have not made any changes to these bylaws that are in effect uh, for those municipalities. They remain in place. Despite this, Speaker, uh, this member and the opposition continue continue to falsely tell tenants that we have removed Once again, I'm going to ask the minister to withdraw the unparliamentary remark and not make another one. Thanks, Speaker. In fact, we announced yesterday that we are proposing to explicitly require that municipal replacement bylaws include Bonds. compensation. So we've been clear on our consultations on setting common rules on the province. This member continues Member, Minister will take a seat. The supplementary question back to the member for University of Rosedale. Uh, Ontario's eviction protection laws are as flimsy as tissue paper. I want to talk about the Landlord Tenant Board. New evidence shows that tenants are being pushed to the back of the queue and are waiting twice as long as landlords to get a decision at the Landlord and Tenant Board. I would call that discrimination. What is this ministry going to do to reform the Landlord Tenant Board so everyone can get access to a fast and fair hearing equally? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for, for that friendly question. Uh, <laughs> the, the number of things that we're doing is phenomenal. We, we have put resources into reforming the system in how it operates, the backbone of the system, Mr. Speaker, but the opposition voted against it. Yep. And then we put resources into recruiting more adjudicators and more back office staff, but the NDP voted against it. And just yesterday, with the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, we announced that we're doubling the number of full-time adjudicators so that we can speed things up for the independent tribunal that sets its dockets to protect both landlords and tenants. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Our province, like the rest of the world, is experiencing the effects of the global economic uncertainty. 
high interest rates and inflation. In responding to the challenges and pressures facing people and businesses, our government recently introduced a budget that laid out a solid plan to invest in the priorities that matter most to the people of Ontario as we build for a stronger future. However, individuals, families, workers and communities in, in my community of Brantford Brant are looking to all governments for help. The federal government also recently introduced their 2023 budget. The people of Ontario expect their provincial leaders to work with the federal government to make life better for everyone. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the most recent federal budget will help address the needs of Ontarians? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member from Brantford, Brant, for that question. You got one thing. We, we really appreciate the federal government, Mr. Speaker, working with us in a number of areas that help Ontario families, Ontario workers, and of course businesses right across this province. Together, we have retracted billions of dollars in investments, putting Ontario and Canada back on the map as an automotive powerhouse, including Volkswagen's recent announcement that it has chosen St. Thomas as the new home of its first ever offshore battery plant. Mr. Speaker, when we work together, we can accomplish great things. That's why it's good to see the federal government's 2023 budget providing support in responding to the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. Ontario Spons. is leading the way, getting good jobs, manufacturing jobs back to Ontario for now and for the future. And Ontario, as was evidenced by the employment numbers this morning, is leading the job, uh, country in job creation. Oh. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. It's great to hear that there is ongoing federal cooperation and support for our plan to build a stronger EV manufacturing economy here in Ontario. Our entire province reaps the benefits and is more prosperous, and when people are working and our manufacturing sector is strong. However, for the people in my riding and in communities across Ontario, local and regional economic uncertainty still remain a major concern. The people of Ontario need to be confident that our government understands what is happening at the federal level in Ottawa and is working on behalf of Ontarians to tackle problems that are important to our province. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on what priorities our government want, wanted to see reflected in the federal budget? Thank you. Mr. Finance. Thank you again to the member from Brantford Grant. You know, that's a great question. First of all, housing. We expect that the federal government will work, work with us on the housing affordability crisis that we talk about every single day in this House. And we continue to call on the federal government to defer the harmonized sales tax on all new large-scale purpose-built rental housing projects to help spur the construction of more rental units. Mr. Speaker, next, the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire wasn't mentioned once in the budget. This is a missed opportunity for workers, for Canada's growing electric vehicle and battery supply chains, as well as Northern Ontario and Indigenous communities. Mr. Speaker, just a few days ago, I released Ontario's 2023 20, budget, and while our government is working hard to build a strong Ontario for today and for tomorrow, we know Response. governments make faster progress when they work hard together. So please join us in working hard together for all Ontarians. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. Life is becoming more and more unaffordable. Even for Ontarians in the first few months of life, the lack of affordability is affecting their lives. Deb's grandson was placed on Enfamil A plus formula at three months of age. She wrote to me about the price gouging her family is struggling with while they search for baby formula. She said, quote, my daughter and son-in-law are always scrambling to locate a store that has it on the shelf. When they do find it, the price has doubled. End quote. Children in Ontario are going hungry while this government makes excuses. When is this government going to stop gouging and make sure every family that needs it has access to affordable baby formula? Exactly. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate the question. Uh, of course, uh, Health Canada uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the lead on this and has been working very closely to ensure that there is a, a stable supply of uh, a formula on, on the shelves. It is something that the Minister of Agriculture uh, and the Minister of Health uh, have been uh, uh, monitoring very closely. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, let me assure uh, uh, the people of the province of Ontario that we are working very closely with Health Canada. We are working very closely with uh, federal health, uh, health officials. We are 
uh, assured at this time that unlike uh, the challenges that the, the federal government had early on when it came to uh, pediatric medicines, that uh, we are not in the same position uh, right now. But I do appreciate the, uh, the question from the member opposite, and uh, she has uh, our assurance, all parents across the province of Ontario have our assurance that uh, we are working very, very closely with Health Canada to ensure that uh, we have a stable supply. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate the government House Leader's attention to this because baby formula is not affordable. As Deb wrote, quote, at first it was about $37 for a box. My daughter just found some at Shoppers Drug Mart priced $67 a box. On Amazon, $77 a box. This concerned grandmother asks, how are these companies allowed to claim shortages and then price gouge young parents? This makes me so disgusted, end quote. I will ask you her question. Deb would like to know, how are single parents making minimum wage supposed to feed their child? Mm. Thank you. The government house leader. Look, specific, uh, specific to, uh, to the, the question with respect to uh, uh, formula, look, we, we, we understand it, and it is something that the Minister of Agriculture uh, uh, was uh, immediately alerted to and uh, contacted uh, uh, Health Canada and federal officials to ensure that there was a stable supply. Uh, for uh, for the people of the province of Ontario, but I think the question in itself though highlights some of the other challenges that we're having, right? So the member highlights that when there is a lack of supply, prices increase and things become unaffordable. And it's at the heart of everything that we've been doing since 2018 here in the province of Ontario, because we understand that the way to bring costs down for the people of the province of Ontario is, in part, when it comes to housing, for instance, having more supply will reduce the cost for the people of the province of Ontario. And they have not been in favour of that. We also understand when it comes to red tape. By reducing red tape and obstacles, it helps bring the, the, the cost down. But at the same time, we brought in things like doubling of the ODSP. We brought in, of course, the lift tax credit. We are there. The Minister of Education, of course, bringing in a nation-leading child care program, nation-leading child care program, which is, which, which is half the cost for the people of the province of Ontario. So we're well on the way to better. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Speaker, and my question is for my great colleague in Mississauga, the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. On April the 6th, Speaker, 2018, Ontarians were heartbroken to hear the news of the devastating bus collision carrying the Humboldt Broncos hockey team. 16 of the 29 passengers lost their lives, and the 13 who survived will bear physical and emotional scar for the rest of their lives. Humboldt Broncos defenseman Logan Boulay succumbed to his injuries the following day on April the 7th. And Logan's parents, Bernadine and Toby Boulay, courageously offered to donate his org organs so that six people could live. What an incredibly difficult decision for any parents to have to make. For the Boulay family, their decision represents the difference that can be made through the act of giving. And speaker, currently, today in Ontario, there are 1,600 people on the waiting list for an organ transplant. Question. Can the minister please speak to the significance of this day and the importance of continuing Logan's legacy of organ donation? Mr. Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to my amazing member from Mississauga Centre for the question. Speaker, while April 7th remains a difficult day for many people and families, it has also become an opportunity that many others have embraced to raise, raise awareness for organ donation, marking this day as the Green Shirt Day in honor of Logan Boulay effect. Just like Logan and his family, everyone who is comfortable and willing to sign up for donation has the power to save the life of another. And my ministry continues to work tirelessly to ensure that Ontarians have every resource necessary to stay informed and access this service if they choose to do so. If you want to register to donate, you can do in person at any Service Ontario location near you or go online Response. at serviceontario.ca slash be a donor and check whether you have already registered as a donor or update an existing registration as long as you have an OHIP eligible Ontarian age 16 and up. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you so much, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. And I just want to reiterate the website, serviceontario.ca slash be a donor. And I encourage all members of this House to go today and check if you are an organ donor. And if you're not, please register so that we can save lives. 
And speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that works to raise awareness about organ donation and how these efforts can make a difference in saving lives. As a nurse working on the front lines, I have personally seen how organ donations can restore hope and provide a future. However, we know that the number of patients who need a life-saving transplant is greater than the number of organs and tissues that are available. While almost 90% of Canadians say they support organ donations, only 32% have registered their intent to donate. I also want to praise the great work of the Trillium Gift of Life Network and their Be a Donor campaign, which is taking place this week. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on, on what Question. our government is doing to support organ and tissue donation registrations? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, many thanks to the great member for the supplementary question. I'm proud to stand in this House and share that over 4.6 million Ontarians are registered as organ and tissue donors. It is a reminder of the selfless nature that makes us proud, vibrant, and community-oriented province that we are. Speaker, and I'm proud that my ministry has enabled over 1.1 million registrations, checks, and updates through the online donor registration service, and more than an additional 3.3 million in-person registrations at our service Ontario locations. Speaker, each and every one of those individuals has the power to perhaps one day one day save the lives of up to eight people and impact as many as 75 others. Speaker, today I want to also Response. remind Ontarians that April is the Be a Donor Month, and in the memory of Logan, the humble Broncos and their families, I hope Ontarians continue to raise awareness and remind others that they too can give the gift of a second chance of life. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. This is to the Premier. At home in St. Paul's, the lineup around our beaten cupboard food bank, run by St. Michael and All Angels, routinely wraps around the block. I remember the first time I handed food to a child. According to Daily Bread Food Bank, one in four food bank users are children. This Conservative government has made things worse. They failed to act on the affordability crisis, Speaker. Children are paying the price. They're paying the price in food banks while this government eats steaks. My question is back to the Premier. Will the Premier Order. finally take responsibility for the affordability crisis so kids aren't lining up at food banks, or will they keep passing the buck on a full stomach, I might add? Thank you. In the reply, Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that very important question. And, and you know, within uh, you know the cost of everything going up, uh, our children are paramount in in, in the in, in this country, in this province, uh, and so that's why uh, we have to be very focused on the issue of affordability. Now, Mr. Speaker, while many are feeling the pinch, and while we've done many things, I would just point to one aspect of food inputs, which is. Frankly, the federal government and their carbon tax. Yep. Yeah. You just increased the Ford carbon Ford. tax again Ford. by three cents. And not only is that a challenge for many at the pump, many who everything. take their children to school or ch drive to work, but it's also a major input in the cost of groceries and the cost of food. So when you keep increasing taxes, that's hurting people, as opposed to this government, which reduced the gas tax to help people. Mr. Speaker, it'd be nice if the minister actually answered the question. A food program in my riding, Spadina Fort York, saw a record number of users Order. in the previous month. Order. One is a senior, Carolyn, and she's using a food bank for the first time. And she writes, It is sad and shameful that we're in this situation. The cost of everything is impossible to live on because of the cost of rent and food. The five biggest grocery retailers have been making record profits while the people buying groceries can no longer afford the food they need. Will this government address record food grocery chain profits, or will they continue to depend upon charities and food banks to feed the people of this province? Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to the member opposite, uh, very important uh, that we all work together to help as many people in this province as poss uh, possible. That, and that's why 
The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, through the Social Services Relief Fund, here, here. provided through the pandemic food supports and many supports for those most in need. Mr. Three Speaker, dollars. that's why through the Trillium Foundation, the Ontario Trillium Foundation, $83 million wow. to help provide grants to non-profits to help with food banks to recover from COVID. Exactly. Mr. Speaker, that's why we're supporting uh, the uh, children and youth and families with $8 million in further funding for Feed, the Feed Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I come back to what I just said. We are taking action on a lot of fronts, uh, including uh, supports for low-income seniors, including uh, lower taxes through credit rebates for uh, low-income workers. Uh, but you know, the federal government could do their part and lower the carbon tax. We Mark. did that. We dropped the gar gas tax. We're doing it for the whole year. That's how we're helping. And the next question, the member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The alarm bells have been ringing for a while now. The cost of living continues to rise astronomically. Grocery stores are raising food prices. Landlords are raising rents. People are falling behind, and they are now turning to food banks in record numbers. In Toronto, for example, the number of people relying on food banks Order. has quadrupled over the last three years. At the Daily Bread Food Bank, there were nearly 270,000 visits in March alone, a record. One third of visitors actually have full-time employment. Full-time employment, but they cannot make ends meet. And for the first time in 25 years, under this government, Mr. Speaker, the number of children using food banks is going up. One in four visitors at the Daily Food Bank, at the Daily Food Bank, Bread, Bread Food Bank, is a child. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is experiencing a crisis of food insecurity. We're talking about hardworking Question. people who can no longer keep up with the skyrocketing cost of living. Why is this government failing so spectacularly at protecting Ontarians from falling victim to food insecurity? To reply, the Premier. I want to, I want to thank the member from Don Valley East, but first of all, I want to acknowledge my niece, my brother uh, Rob's daughter up there from Michael Power. Good to see you, honey. I love you. One day you'll be sitting down here. You know, talking, you know, talking about affordability, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the member from Don Valley East, they voted against 10 cents cut uh, the gas tax. Wow. They, they voted against the, reducing the, the tolls or getting rid of the tolls on the 412, 418. They voted against increasing the ODSP by 5%. You voted against increasing the minimum wage, the highest minimum wage in the entire country. Our province is on fire. We created another 21,000 jobs last month. That's six consecutive months in a row. 640,000 more people are working today Response. than when they had the regime for 15 years and destroyed this province from top to bottom. Order. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, the government to cross has destroyed health care from top to bottom, and now they're turning to the economy. Uh, Mr. Sir. Speaker, when the sir. level of food insecurity has reached order. the epic order. When the Security has reached the epic proportions we are seeing now. It is a clear sign of this government's failures. We are literally talking about parents and children struggling to eat, even parents that have full-time jobs making more than minimum wage. We need to adequately address the historic levels of inflation Ontarians are experiencing with proactive financial release. Really, Order. the rising costs of things like food and housing have vastly outpaced this government's half-hearted measures as they pay lip service to the struggles of Ontarians. For a government with $44 billion in contingency funds, $12.5 billion in excess funds over the next three years, and a well-documented underspending habit, you would think they could find some room in their budget to address the most essential needs. Something isn't right, Mr. Speaker. How can this government run a province, let alone an economy, if hardworking families with full-time jobs can't even afford to feed their children? 
And to reply, the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's pretty rich coming from a, a party that destroyed this this province for 15 years, chased 300,000 jobs out of our province because of high energy costs, high regulations, high taxes. All they believed in is taxing the people. We believe in giving back to the people. 1.1 million low-income workers have received a tax cut. We made sure that we increased minimum wage, as I said. We extended 10 percent off tuition for those great students up there that are going to university. They're paying 10 percent less. <laughs> Under the Liberals, all they did is jack up the cost, and on health care, Mr. Speaker, we've hired 60,000 new nurses registered in Ontario, 8,000 new doctors registered. As you destroyed health care in this province, there is hallway health care. We've never seen a worse system. We're fixing Response. that system. We're making Ontario prosperous, and people are going to thrive and prosper in Ontario. Order. Order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay Atticoke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Constituents in my riding of Thunder Bay Atticoke can see that significant work is underway in correctional facilities across the north. Major infrastructure developments are occurring in facilities located in Thunder Bay and Kenora. It is vital that modernization and improvements to these facilities addresses the safety needs for staff and provides a high standard of care and supervision for those in custody. All workers need to be assured that they have the tools they need to do their jobs safely and well. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please provide information about the progress and implications of these projects? Thank you. To reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the incredible member from Thunder Bay Atacokan for his question. And, Mr. Speaker, I was recently in Thunder Bay with him, and I can tell you how truly impressive the sites are. The ultimate goal of our correctional infrastructure projects is to create a safer environment for our correctional staff and those in our custody. And not only have we expanded the current Thunder Bay Correctional Centre, but we've added a 50 new bed, modular, state-of-the-art build. We've also started breaking ground on the $1.2 billion correctional complex in Thunder Bay. Mr. Speaker, public safety is the utmost priority for our government. Monsieur le Président, pour moi, c'est personnel. Mr. Speaker, per month, thanks to uh, the work of these officers, Ontarians will, say, will feel safer in their communities. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for that response. It's encouraging news that our government is focused on investing in a series of projects to modernize correctional services to improve the health, safety, and security of provincial facilities. While our government is taking action to prioritize safety for correctional staff and those in custody, we must respond to serious concerns about capacity pressures in the correctional system. Overcrowding creates a difficult, unsafe, and unhealthy environment for everyone and leads to increased workplace health and safety concerns. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please elaborate on how these infrastructure projects are addressing capacity in Ontario's corrections system? Okay. Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my friend for the question. And I'm truly excited about this project because we're replacing out-of-date infrastructure that goes back to the 19th century. This new modern facility will provide staff with the tools and technology and a healthy work environment to do their jobs safely and effectively. And it has been an honour, I might say, Mr. Speaker, to meet many of the Native inmate liaison officers during my visit. These are truly amazing people. Our new facility in Thunder Bay, due to be completed in about four years, will have a 345-bed capacity to address the pressures, create additional space for programming, and expand supports for inmates with mental health issues. Monsieur le Président, je suis fier de... Mr. Speaker, I am proud of our staff and uh, they are wonderful people who are protecting us every day. The member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. 
Deandra is a four-year-old child who has severe sleep apnea. In a sleep test, it showed 85% of Deandra's airway is blocked by adenoids when sleeping, and she was referred for urgent surgery. Her surgery was scheduled for March at SickKids, but was cancelled, and the reason given for the postponement was COVID surgical backlog. Worse, a new date was not given. Sick kids have told the family that they are trying to get through as fast as they can. We know they have a backlog of 12,000 surgeries. Speaker, Deandra has had to be resuscitated at least once after nearly suffocating to death while sleeping. My question is, how long does the Premier think is an appropriate time for Deandra to wait? On this, Mentary Assistant the Minister of Health, Member for Edmund Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much for the question, and I'd certainly be happy to look into this case if, if you wanted to talk to me about it afterwards. But nothing is more important uh, to all of us than protecting the health and well-being of Ontarians, and especially our children. We're working with pediatric hospitals to ramp up their capacity wherever possible, and that means making permanent investments to increase the number of critical care beds at uh, CHEO, Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, McMaster Children's Hospital, London Health Sciences Children's Hospital, Hospital for Sick Children, and the Kingston Health Sciences Centre. This government has invested almost a billion dollars in the uh, surgical recovery um, funding and uh, we will continue to make the investments necessary and spare no expense, really, to make sure that the people of this problem, province, and especially our children, continue to have access to the quality care that they know and expect. Supplementary question. Speaker, Deandra's mother, Chanel, and her grandmother, Sylvia, are in the gallery today, and I invite the member to meet with them after question period. Both mom and grandma don't sleep. They stay up all night watching Deandra to make sure she doesn't suffocate to death. They're panicked and exhausted. This is the experience of so many families across Ontario, and yet this government underspends on health care. Speaker, every day Deandra waits for surgery is another day she risks losing her life. It's another day the family is put in stress and anxiety. Will the Premier ensure that every public operating room in this province stays open and is fully staffed so kids like Deandra can get the surgery they urgently need and not have to wait and roll the dice? Member for Edmonton Lawrence. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for the question. Obviously, this government has pulled out all the stops and is uh, in the midst of the largest health human re uh, resources recruitment and training retention initiative in Ontario's history. We've made record investments, and as the Premier noted earlier, 60,000 new nurses here in Ontario, 8,000 new uh, uh, doctors, including 1,800 family physicians, and we're going to continue to make those investments. That, that's part of the reason we brought forward Bill 60. Uh, we're also uh, in our Your Health Plan uh, expanding family health teams, and we've got uh, a $30 million investment in that. We're doing everything we can to make sure that Ontarians get the kind of care that they know and deserve. Amen. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ajax. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Veterans have always held an important and special place in my heart. They defend the rights and freedoms that we often take for granted. Through conversations with members from my Legion, we speak about the responsibilities of the Re Royal Legion and Veteran Affairs Canada and the needs of veterans. Could the Speaker, could the Minister please share a program that we have put in place by our government that supports our veterans? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the great member for Ajax for the great work that she does uh, in her writing, and thank you very much for the important question. Speaker, I know the debt that we owe to veterans for the sacrifices they have made to our country and they continue to make to make sure that we live in a better place. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is the only province in Canada with a financial assistance program created specifically for veterans. The Soldiers' Aid Commission provides financial assistance for veterans and their families of up to $2,000 for, per household for the following items, health-related items like hearing aids, glasses, prescriptions, and dental needs, services like home repairs, moving costs, or furniture, specialized equipment like assistive devices, wheelchair, and prosthetics, 
personal items, Mr. Speaker, and employment-related supports like work clothes, work boots, short-term costs to improve employment opportunities, and I will have more to say in the supplementary. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. I'm happy our province has put in, in place additional programs and supports for our veterans. When we think of veterans, many of us instinctively think of about our older generation, which those which served in the wars, uh, the World Wars and Korean War. However, the reality is that there are many young veterans who served Canada in most recent conflicts, such as the Afghan War. It is vital that programs and support adapt to meet their needs and are modern and change for to. to Sorry, modern and, and supply needs for their families. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how the Soldiers Aid Commission is uh, responded to younger generations of veterans? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Speaker, Speaker, we need to continue to support our veterans, including the young cohorts, Mr. Speaker. That's why our government passed a new law in 2020 to expand the Soldiers Aid Commission's program to include all Ontario veterans and their families, regardless of where and when they serve, Mr. Speaker. Now, this was the first meaningful cha change in the mandate after years of being ignored by the previous government, which saw the Commission's financial assistance constrained to a very limited group of former servicemen and women, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to add that to support this expanded mandate, the Commission's funding has been increased by about 600 per cent to $1.55 million each year, Mr. Speaker. And last year, we invested $529,000 through the True Patriot Love Foundation to deliver a broad range of mental health supports to veterans Response. returning to civilian, civilian life. Mr. Speaker, we must never forget the bravery and sacrifice of our veterans, and I thank each and every person that serves us in uniform. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton Centre. Start the clock. I recognize the member for Hamilton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is to the Minister of Education. Hamilton Wentworth District School Board Trustee Sabrina Dahab this week successfully passed a motion to redraft 2022-2023 suspension and exp expulsion data to show desegregated categories such as gender and race by 2023 because she knows what it'll show, that kids in schools who are the most impacted by discretionary suspensions and expulsions are black, racialized, indigenous, and disabled students. We have the data to support suspensions and expulsions don't work. They perpetuate the school to prison pipeline. In 2020, the minister announced a ban on discretionary suspensions for children in kindergarten to grade three. Is the minister willing to extend this ban to include all elementary school students? And to reply, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are very cognizant of the disproportionality impacting racialized and Indigenous students in Ontario. It's the basis for why we uh, essentially eliminated the ability of principals and educators to suspend children in kindergarten, grade one, and two, and three. There's got to be a better way by which we can uh, ensure these young people are focused and stay in school, integrated in their classrooms, than to suspend them at that young age. Mr. Speaker, we also saw the data that informed the decision of this government to de-stream the entire grade nine curriculum on the basis that we want to give young people equal opportunity and a pathway to success by removing the barriers that impede their progress. We know there's more to do in the context of fighting racism, discrimination, and barriers in school, and I look forward to working with community to build further initiatives we can undertake in this province to ensure every young person graduates, achieves, and get a good job in this province. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, school boards in Peel, Ottawa, and Toronto have all spoken up about the data which proves that suspensions and expulsions disproportionately impact black, racialized, and disabled students because they are far more likely to be treated punitively than their peers. In 2021, a school board in Dallas became the first large urban public school board in North America to ban discretionary disciplinary suspensions for this reason. The data is clear. Discretionary suspensions is a tool that feeds racism, anti-black racism, and ableism in our school system. Will the Minister of Education answer Trustee Dahab's question and extend your ban on discretionary suspensions for kids in elementary school that go beyond grade three? 
Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the research is abundantly clear about how we can ensure that racialized children could succeed in the classroom. Let's ensure that those kids are able to see their educators that reflect the communities in which they work. When the NDP and the Liberals had an opportunity to work with the government to eradicate Regulation 274, a regressive regulation that denies principals the ability to hire a highly talented, racialized educator in a community with many racialized kids, they opposed that effort. So, Mr. Speaker. Order. If members opposite want to advance the cause of anti-racism, you would have supported the government Order. to de-stream the curriculum. You would have supported the government when, for the first time in the history of Canada's of Canada, Order. we actually overtook and supervised the board on the basis of anti-black racism. Order. We have taken action in this area. Unfortunately, we've done so without the support of the NDP and the Liberals in this province. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. The development of technology in recent years has driven a push for more technical training in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields, also known as STEM. However, the numbers of women employed in technology careers, as well as in trades-related occupations, are well below their male counterparts. This is troubling, Speaker, especially with the overwhelming labour shortages in many sectors across our province. It is essential that all students are exposed to technological education to learn critical skills so they can succeed in a good-paying job. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is empowering Question. students, especially young women, to prepare them for the jobs of tomorrow? The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member of Newmarket Aurora, a great member in that community. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, I am proud that our government is taking action to ensure that students across the province have the tools and skills they need to build prosperity for their generation in Ontario. And our Minister of Education has worked di diligently to ensure that this becomes a reality. And I was honoured to participate in the announcement um, with the Minister of Education that our government will be revising the Grade 9 10 curriculum and implementing the requirement for students to take at least one technological course. This is great for all students, but especially for girls who will now have even more exposure to the highly rewarding fields in STEM. And this is reassuring news for both me as a public servant and a mother that we are taking the right measures to prepare young women to pursue fulfilling careers Spons? in the skilled trades in STEM. And this supports the thousands of jobs that are being triggered, um, that are the creation of thousands of jobs that are being triggered by the. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that response. It is encouraging that all students will have an opportunity to explore options for career pathways in technology and trades related occupations through hands on experiences and technical skills learned in the classroom. Our government must implement solutions now that will help address Ontario's significant labour shortages. It is projected that by 2026, approximately one in five job openings in Ontario will be in the skilled trades-related fields. With more than 100,000 unfilled skilled trades jobs right now, it is critical that our government does all that we can to attract more young women to pursue fulfilling, good-paying careers in the trade. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how technological education will help prepare young women to pursue careers in sectors that are vital to our economy? The Associate Minister. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member. Young women deserve a life of opportunity and one that will help them become successful leaders in any industry they choose. And part of navigating that success is exposing young women to non-traditional careers early in their education. Our government's commitment to equip students with the skills they need in STEM will prepare them for careers for the future. Young women who traditionally may have been discouraged from entering the chain trades will now develop skills and knowledge that will help them understand and contribute to the technological advances in the changing workplace and world. The recent changes in the graduation requirement are another step our government is taking to increase women's participation in the workforce and empower them to succeed in sectors that are Response. vital to our economy. We have taken these steps because we know that when women succeed, Ontario succeeds. Next question, member for Meshkigawak, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. For the Minister of Francophone Affairs, as from April 1st, there will be a period of adaptation. There were many things regarding this law. There is a lack of employees because of this, and all the agencies subject to this law will not receive services in a bilingual way. How will you ensure that bilingual employees be, and which will be the repercussions for those who will not respond to this law? I thank the member for his question. I am proud that our government is the first government who modernized the law for services in French for the first time in 35 years, since the very beginning of the history of the law regarding bilingual services. We know the importance of Franco providing these services for Franco-Ontarians. This law will be enforced us from April 1st. It comprises nine measures that are essential to ensure that francophones in Ontario receive quality services from the very from the establishment of the very first contact. I agree with the opposite member. There's a lot of work to do to ensure that our workforce is prepared to provide these services in a bilingual way. Thank you to the Minister for the response. French language is always unprotected. This has happened for the last 40 years. There are many factors to it. Immigra Francophone immigration, post secondary, secondary institutions, Francophone organizations. What are the strategies that your ministry is going to set in place to ensure continuity of our institutions and organizations to ensure that Francophonie is no loss in Ontario? Thank you, Speaker. And again, thank you for the question. The loss of bilingualism that we've seen throughout the recent information that was given by Statistics Canada is a national, shows a national phenomenon. In Ontario, our government has set concrete measures to respond to the needs of the Francophone community and to face the challenges that they have been seeing. We have modernized the law, the law to provide uh, francophone service, bilingual services. With the work that we have done by modernizing this law, we have also presented a global strategy to address the fear that is brought by the member opposite so that we can help communi francophone communities to help Francophone and bilingual organizations in their communities. 
Speaker, no government in the history of Ontario has done as much as we have done. Thank you, Speaker. It's always a pleasure to take the floor in French, and I have liked this exchange, this previous exchange. Culturalism. Our province is home to people from all across the world who are proud to call Ontario their home. While our province has much to offer, we recognize that diverse workers and entrepreneurs face unique challenges when it comes to finding jobs, starting businesses, and accessing opportunities. And I met with many of them at my constituency office, and particularly hardworking local business owners who are just trying to make a go of it. Our government is working diligently to address systemic challenges here in Ontario while investing in diverse talent and communities to support job creation and economic growth. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting diverse entrepreneurs who are looking to start a business here in Ontario? The minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the incredibly uh, hardworking member uh, for, from Windsor to come see for the question. Um, uh, speaker, as the member, member alluded to, uh, a diverse Ontario is critical to our economic success of our province. Diverse communities help enrich our cultural fabric and build our province into the amazing place that is through their talent, hard work, passion, fresh ideas and perspectives. Speaker, as part of our government's ambitious plan to build a strong economy for today and tomorrow, we are inv investing an additional $15 million into, the, into Black, Indigenous and other diverse aspiring entrepreneurs in Ontario start and scale their businesses. This funding will help them overcome barriers by providing them with coaching, training and startup funding Response. to get their businesses off the ground and set up for long-term success. Ontario continues to lead our nation in job growth, and this will continue to help create jobs and opportunities for families, strengthen communities across the province, and build a stronger Ontario for all. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. Uh, this is all good news for the people of Ontario. Since day one, our government, under the leadership of the Premier, has been committed to eliminating barriers to economic success for all Ontarians and acknowledging the unique contributions of diverse communities. Throughout my home region of Windsor-Essex, we have not only seen a rich history of people of African descent, but we are also seeing many active community organizations and projects dedicated to preserving this vital history and building a bright future ahead. The black community, as well as other diverse communities and their businesses, are truly crucial to the growth and success of Windsor and the surrounding areas. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the supports that are available for diverse communities across Ontario? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, I'd like to thank the member for the great question. Um, Speaker, our government is opening doors and creating opportunities for Ontario's diverse communities. This year alone, we'll be investing more than $35 million to the Black Youth Action Plan and RAISE grant to help thousands of Black youth and diverse entrepreneurs succeed and reach their full potential. I know that my colleagues from across government are doing this work as well. Speaker, whether it's improving outcomes for children, leaving the child welfare system under the leadership of the new Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, or investing in graduation coaching and tutoring supports to help black students succeed in and beyond the classroom under the leadership of the Minister of Education, or providing underrepresented groups with the skills and training they need to find good paying jobs under the leadership of the Minister of Labor, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Our government is leaving no stone unturned, Mr. Speaker, to ensure Ontarians from all walks of life Spons? have every opportunity to succeed. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. And I recognize the member for Halliburton, Quarth Lakes Brock, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank uh, my page, uh, Elizabeth Keyes Brazier from Halliburton, Quarth Lakes Brock, for her amazing service to the legislature and to introduce her mom, Shelley Brazier, and her sister, Lillian Keyes Brazier. Welcome. 
And I recognize the government House Leader, Understanding Order 59. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Let me just, uh, uh, first of all, thank all of the members for what was another uh, very productive week on behalf of the people of the province of Ontario, and wish all of those who are celebrating over the weekend uh, uh, a very uh, happy uh, and safe, uh, safe uh, holiday. Uh, to the leaders of the opposition, we have not yet finalized uh, the order of business for uh, the week after the uh, constituency week, uh, so I know the uh, leader of uh, Her Majesty's loyal opposition will look forward to spending some time with me as we uh, organize the, uh, the business oh, uh, like nice over, the next, uh, over the next few days. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. And before I uh, adjourn the House for the morning, I want to introduce some very special guests who are here in the Speaker's Gallery. My friends from the Wellington Halton Hills Provincial Constituency Office, Judy Brownrigg, Karen Thomas, and Janice Howard. They didn't tell me they were coming down, so I'm not sure who's looking after the office today. <laughs> but I think they're here to celebrate Tartan Day. This house stands in recess until 1 p.m.